Okay. She said, we can go. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get, get to heaven, what a day what of rejoicing day that, of will rejoicing be. that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow nor in sight. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will be whole. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. This is Michael. Okay. Mm. <laughs> All right. It's good to be back in Lord's. Can we turn that down a little bit? Can you still hear me? All right. It's good to be back to the Lord's house today. Again, we thank him for another opportunity to come this way and for how good he's been to us this week and allowing us uh, to return. We thank him for uh, all that he's done for us and really thank him for saving us one day. Uh, it's the greatest thing that could ever happen to somebody down here in this world. and uh, Getting married and having a family and having kids is uh is wonderful uh but truly getting saved is the greatest thing that can ever happen to a person and i'm glad that he saved me one day he did it because i asked him to and uh and if you ever get saved it'll be because you ask him to do it for you it'll not be by any works of your hand it'll be because that you asked the the one that died and bled for us to save you and if you do that and uh, and trust in him and only him then he'll save you and i'm glad for that uh we'll be studying in hebrews chapter number nine and uh, we tried to uh, finish up chapter eight last week and so we'll start in chapter number nine we'll try to go through the first ten verses of chapter number nine today and uh, before we go we've got uh, many things to pray about and uh, sickness and and uh, 
the unsaved. We always need to pray for them, and we thank him for, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the gift of prayer that he gives us. You know, sometimes that's all we've got is, uh, is to be able to pray to him and, and let him work things out in, in our lives and in the lives of the people that we love. And uh, I'm glad that he gives us that. Let us pray before we get started. So, Lord, as we come to you today, we thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings. We thank you for this, another day that you've given us, Lord, that we come out and worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. And we thank you for everything that you do for us, for watching out over us and taking care of us, Lord. We just ask you to continue to remember those that are sick, Lord. Remember the lost, Lord. They need you worse than anything, Lord. And we just ask you to be with those that that may need you the most today. We ask you to be with each one. Remember this service, Lord. Help me to, to speak the things that you want me to. Be with Philip as he stands to preach and the singing. Lord, just be with everything, Lord, that we do from worship of you. Lord, and we ask you these things in your precious name. Amen. And so we begin chapter number nine, the book of Hebrews. And uh, <clears throat> I was wondering how... Uh, I should teach this, and and uh, the Lord came to me this morning. He gave me away, and so that's the way we'll go. And uh, I hope that it, I hope that it makes a difference to you that that uh, it'll bring some understanding to you, uh, and in knowing about the worship of God. And this, these first ten verses here show the uh, is a is a way that Paul chose to show the worship of old and the and the new worship that we have through Jesus, uh, and so we'll begin reading in verse number uh, one and we'll go through verse number ten. Then we'll come back and and try to teach those things that the Lord has given us. And verse number one, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. And so we see a description of the old tabernacle that the Lord first gave to the children of Israel in the book of Exodus uh, as they were coming up out of Egypt. And, uh, and, and so he gave them this tabernacle as a way uh, to show them how to worship him. And, uh, and so uh, if we go back through, it said, Then verily the first covenant uh, had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So uh, we understand that uh, God's presence was signified to them through that ark uh, that was inside the Holy of Holies, uh, in this tabernacle and that this uh, tabernacle was made of worldly things. It was uh, made of wood and the articles therein were uh, mostly made of wood and uh, a few of them were overlaid with gold and God is, that's what God gave uh, these children to carry around with them uh, to signify his presence and, and where he was with them. And uh, said, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick. And so they had this tabernacle, and if you remember uh, back in the Word of God, they had a, uh, when they would set this thing up, they had a fence around uh, the tabernacle, and then there was a tent set up in the midst of that, inside of that fence, 
And there were two compartments to that tent. The first was the, was the holy place, and then there was a veil, and then there was the holy of holies, uh, wherein the ark was set. And so these are the things that was contained uh, within that tent and how the priests went about uh, the worship of God and, pre and presenting gifts and sacrifices uh, that were needful for the worship of God. And so uh, number two said, verse number two said, for there was a tabernacle made. And uh, man made that tabernacle. He made it after the uh, model that God gave to Moses for them to make it on. But, God, uh, but man made that tabernacle. And it was made out of uh, mostly earthly things and uh, things that were grown here on this earth because uh, the linen and things that they used and the, and the rods that they would put up for this thing were, were grown here on this earth. And uh, so it was made by man. The first, wherein was the candlestick? And this candlestick was, was put out there and it was put in there to be a light and to the people you realize you were inside a tent and uh, so there was uh, not a lot of sunlight that came into that place and they had this candlestick that was made to give light to this place so that the priest could see what they were doing and so the things uh, could be seen and so that candlestick was in there and the table and the showbread and the Lord told them to make a table and uh, the table was made of wood and overlaid with gold and on this table were 12 loaves of bread and the twelve were, signi were signifying the twelve tribes of Israel, and that all of them were equal. Each tribe had an equal part in what God was doing with the children of Israel, and uh, and so that was laid out there for the on the table, and this was laid out in, inside that sanctuary, inside that that tent, and so uh, this bread was changed out every week on the Sabbath. And, uh, and when it was changed out, the bread that was there, and they put new bread, the bread that was there was consumed by the priests. And that was a part of their, uh, that was part of what, they, what the Lord gave them as their food was they, they gave them these loaves of bread. And so the priests would consume them uh, once a week uh, on the Sabbath. And, and so we come down to verse number two, or number three, and it said, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. And uh, uh, there was a veil put into this tent that divided it into two rooms. The first room where the table was and where the candlestick was, and then there was a veil that said it was made out of fine Egyptian linen. And, uh, and, and the priest could go in uh, every day and they were continually serving in that first room uh, where they went and, and, and offering up prayers and doing the things that the Lord wanted them to do. But they, through that veil and into that holiest of holies where the ark was, the high priest only could go, and he could only go one time a year on the Day of Atonement, and he would take that blood from the sacrifice that he would sacrifice for himself and for the children of Israel, and he would go once per year into that place and he would place that blood on the mercy seat that was on top of the ark between the cherubim's wings. And, uh, and so that was his job, and that was the only time that they could go beyond that veil to where that holy, to where the ark was. And uh, in verse number four, it said, which had the golden censer. Now, there's a kind of a peculiar thing here, and that when this description is given in Exodus, the golden censer was on the other side of the veil and it was right beside of the veil but it was on the table side and on the candlestick side but Paul here describes it as being uh, after the second veil on the inside where the ark was and we'll get into that in a few minutes of why that is but that golden censer was where they would burn incense and that incense and the, and the perfume and stuff that would come off of the, the burning of that incense was uh, it was kind of like the prayers of the people and, and a sweet smell and a savor unto God uh, that would go with that sacrifice. And when that priest, that, on that day of atonement, when he would take that blood in there as the, to place it on the mercy seat, he would take that golden censer with him. 
Well, that incense burning sweet, and so that thing went in behind that veil once a year, and, uh, and when he was done, he would bring it back out and place it on the other side of the curtain again. And, uh, and the Bible says that, that he was in there, and he wasn't in there long. He was just in there long enough to accomplish the job where he was taking the blood in there to place it on the mercy seat for the sins of the people and for himself. And as soon as that work was done, he was brought out there. The Bible says that he even sold bells uh, on the inside of his garments, and he would be in there working and doing that work, and the bells would always be ringing. And if the bell stopped, that would mean that he had done something wrong and God had killed him, and they would have that rope tied on his leg when he went in there so that uh, they could drag him out of there if he did something wrong and God killed him. It was a serious thing for the priest to do this. And it had to be done in a serious way. If there was, if there was anything wrong, that priest would die. And that, we ought to be so thankful that God made another way for us. That we could have, that we wouldn't have to live like that. Now, it was good, and, and everything that the Bible laid out here was good. But Jesus is better. And that's why, that's why Paul wrote this epistle, to show these Jews that, that even though the things that they had were good, they were tough, but Jesus is better. And uh, Jesus told us to, to uh, put his yoke on us, that his burden was easy and it was light. And, buddy... When you look at the way that people used to have to live, the children of Israel used to have to live, Jesus is a much easier way to live. And I'm glad that we have him. I'm glad that he, he did those things for us. And I'm glad that we live in a day of grace and not in the law. Because it's, it'd be hard for us to live that law, buddy. We'd live it for about 10 minutes. That'd be about how long the, the best of us could keep it. And some of us would fall in the first minute. Of trying to live that law. I'm glad Jesus made a new way for us. And so uh, that golden censer was there, and the uh, Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. Now that Ark, it was also made of wood that was overlaid with gold. Lots of significant things in, in that type and a type of Jesus. And, uh, and inside of that Ark there were some things. And uh, the golden pot that had man, and we know that the Lord fed the children of Israel as they were making their journey uh, in the wilderness with manna. And uh, I guess they were traveling. They couldn't uh, put down crops and raise their own food, so they had to have a way to be fed. And the Lord uh, chose manna to feed them. He'd uh, send it every day. And they'd gather it up and eat their own and throw the rest out because new was coming the next day. And, uh, and uh, there's, there, he feeds us every day, don't he? And, uh, and takes care of us, and everything that we have is from him. And, uh, and I'm glad of that. And Aaron's rod that budded. And so at one point in Aaron's ministry, when it was appointed to him to be priest, there was a controversy that arose about him being the high priest. And so they had a contest there, and Aaron had an old uh, rod that was made of wood and I thought about it, when I thought about it, I thought Uncle Mo, he's got him a walking stick. And uh, that thing's made of wood, and it's been, uh, that wood is dead. And, uh, and he walks with that thing every day, and you may have a walking stick that you keep there around the house. I've got a few that I use to poke a fire with when I build a fire and, and swat at a dog every now and then if it needs it. Uh, but them sticks are dead. And, uh, and so... Aaron's rod was dead, and when that contest came for to see who was gonna who was the true high priest, Aaron that old dead stick of or rod that Aaron had it budded, and and showed that it had life in it. And I'm glad that uh, that is a picture of Jesus and how he was he died for our sins and rose again the third day, and and uh, the newness of life came out of that rod. And so that rod was laid in there as a remembrance to the people. And so everything that was contained in the ark was a remembrance of what God had done for them. And, uh, and the tables of the covenant. So the Ten Commandments were also in that ark. And uh, that signified the law that, that, that God gave them to live by and to worship by and to know him by. And, uh, and so they kept those things in that ark. And wherever that ark went, 
the Lord told them where to go and they would follow him and all those things were contained in that ark as a memorial to the children of Israel. Verse number 5, And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot speak particularly. Now in the they had the ark and that ark was made of wood and, and was covered in gold but on top of it sat... Uh, a piece that, that that had those cherubims over it, and there was a mercy seat that sat there, and and those cherubims would spread their wings out over that thing. There were two of them on each side, and they would spread their wings out over it to shadow that mercy seat. And so uh, that's where the priest would bring that blood to put it on that mercy seat once per year uh, for the sins of the people. And uh, and so that is that is what was contained in this tabernacle. And the Bible said, now the when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. And so it was the priest's job. Now, if you and I were of the children of Israel back then, and we were not of the Levite line, and we weren't priests, we couldn't go into this place. It was only the place for the priest to go and to do the service of God and, and to worship and to, and to carry the things that the children of Israel needed to him. And, and, and that is the way that he chose for them to go. Only the priest could go in. And we need to remember that. It said, verse number 7, said, But unto the second went the high priest alone. And so we described that, that once a year the high priest and only the high priest, see, even the other priest couldn't even come in to the holy place, to the holy of holies. Only the high priest could go once a year. And it said that he didn't go without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. And we described that and, and how the bells were on him. And he had to do everything right when he went in there that one day a year. And uh, said the, the Bible goes on, said the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. And so God had a plan all along that this was going to be the way it was until uh, the Bible here in verse number 10 calls it until the Reformation came. And uh, I'm glad that the Reformation did come one day. And he came in a, in a, in a manger, and he grew up to be a man, and that man died for our sins. And, uh, and was buried and was resurrected, got up the third and appointed day, and he went back to the Father. And he is sitting there at his right hand now, making intercession for us. And, uh, and so this was a picture of, of uh, all this that, G that God had them do, and all the things that they made, and all the ordinances and the services that they did, and the sacrifices were just a picture of what Jesus was going to come one day and do for all of us. And I'm glad that it was that way. And so uh, Jesus had to fulfill everything that was written of him, and he did that. And, and, he, and he is a living example of what these man-made things were early on in the lives of the, of the Israelites. And we, we'll go on to verse number 8. It said, The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time when pre then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did, ser did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now that's important, that while the priests were doing all this stuff, it was good, and it was what God told him to do, but it could not do anything about the sin. All it did was roll that sin over. It could not make anything perfect. It couldn't fix anything. It couldn't, uh, it couldn't deal with sin. All it did was push sin off until the Reformation came and could really do something with it. Verse number 10 said, Which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. And so the Reformation time when Paul wrote this epistle, Jesus had been to the earth. And that Reformation had come and he had done his work. And the things that he, uh, and the things that he needed to do to be our Savior and to provide a way to uh, God for us. And so we see that uh, that is the, how the old things were done. And uh, so today, as, as the lesson goes, I want to go back through these, 
these bo- these verses. And so Paul wrote this epistle to show the children of Israel and the Jews, the cre- and they had some of them had become Christians. And so these Jewish Christians, he wanted to show them that uh, how the old things were done was just a picture of what Jesus did on the cross for them. And that how that is better than what had gone on before. And so uh, we want to look at how the worship changed with the work of Jesus through this first ten verses of this chapter. And uh, uh, First of all, we have the candlestick. And John chapter number 1 and uh, verses 1 through 9, let's, let's read that. Now we're talking about the candlestick. And everything that was in this place was a picture of what Jesus would do. And so that candlestick gave those priests light when they served in there. And uh, and so let's read in chapter number 1, verse number 1 of John. It said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him. Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. And if you notice here in verse number 7 in your Bible, that word light should be capitalized. And that's because the light was Jesus. That is who the light was that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, and that is Jesus, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And we see that Jesus is the light that came into the world. And and, uh, here a while back we were teaching on on light, and uh, you look at at darkness, and, and it's been a full moon here, uh, the moon's been up pretty good for the last week or so, and and uh, there's they's a pretty good amount of light. But during the new moon, it gets pretty dark in this old world. And uh, the boys bought me a some time ago for Christmas, I believe. They bought me a big old spotlight, and you pull the trigger on that thing, and buddy, he'll get out there. And uh, and and I looked at that thing, and you could shine it. And I can see that mountain across from the house get light on it. I mean, that light will go that far. And, uh, and what you find is that darkness flees from light. Uh, when there's light around darkness, darkness is gone. And it's non-existent because the light shines and the light defeats darkness every time. And I'm glad that our light in Jesus will defeat the powers of this world every time. It may not look like it every time. It may look like he's got the upper hand now for things that are going on in this world, but there's a time coming when the light's going to win out and darkness is going to be done away with forever and all that we're going to have is light. The Bible says that when we get to heaven, there's not going to be any need for no sun or moon because Jesus is the light thereon that we will live by when we make it up there. I'm glad he is the light. And so that candlestick, Jesus, he's that candlestick, buddy. He's the one that provides lights for us. He's the one that shows us the way. He shows us the impediments that are in our way and gives us a way around them. He is good to us. And he lights the way for us. And I'm glad for that. So we uh, we go on where the candlestick and the table and the showbread. And so uh, Jesus also... Uh, had some things to say. He was he about the showbread, and you you look at the manna that was inside of the ark, and the showbread that was on the other side of that veil, and uh, and we know that Jesus told them in a in a place over there that he was he was the bread of life, and uh, and what does bread do? Well, bread is 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 how we live. We have to have things to eat to live. Uh, and it's a sustenance for us. If we've got any power to do anything, you have to eat to have that power to do anything. And so uh, we want to to read. Uh, we're reading John chapter number six.
We'll start here in verse number 28. It said, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And he was talking to, to some Jews one day by the sea, and they wanted to know that question. What, what might we do to work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him he hath sent. They said, Therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? And they were always wanting to see a sign. Uh, a sign of what, what the Lord could do. And uh, sometimes we ourselves seek for signs. The best thing is just to believe God. Amen. Trust in Him. And, and uh, that will take you farther than any sign you'll ever see. Said our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread, bread from heaven to eat. And they were looking for a sign from him. And Jesus told them, "This one got them tore all to pieces. This one got them to where they wanted to kill him." Just about said. Then Jesus said to them, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven and is given." giveth light into the world. And they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. They just want the bread. They didn't want really what he was talking about. They just want the bread so they'd have something to eat always. He said, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. We see that he is the bread of life. And... Uh, He's the bread two ways into us. He's the bread. If we, if we don't ever eat of Him in salvation, you'll never make it. There is no other way. You have to come through Jesus. And, his, and He is the bread of life. And that bread is, is uh, contained in this Bible and everything that is written of Him. And you, uh, when you, This book is about Jesus. Even the Old Testament. The, only, the reason the Old Testament was written was pointing the way and giving signs of what Jesus would do when he came in the New Testament. It's just a book about Jesus. And so if we want the bread of life, we have to get it from the book. That's why uh, the Bible says that to be saved, you have to hear the preaching of the Word to be saved. And then after you're saved, we have to get into this Word and learn of Him. The things that He wants us to know. And through the Holy Spirit, it'll teach us through this Word about Him. And that's how we sustain our uh, eternal life. That's how He sustains us down here in this world. It's through the Bible and through the words of this book. James has often said, and we say it a lot, said, get in this Bible and let this Bible get in you. And it'll make life a whole lot easier going through this world to have the words of the Lord written in your heart. And the times when you ain't got your Bible handy with you and you're, you're outside and you need something from Him, if you've got them words in your heart, the Holy Spirit will bring it up to you. And quick, as a, uh, quick as a wink, He'll bring it to you, those words that will help you get through whatever uh, situation that you're in. And so Jesus is the bread of life, whether it be the manna and the, and the ark or whether it was the showbread that was contained here on this table. He's our life and He's our sustenance. And he's how we're going to make it through this world. So we'll go back to Hebrews chapter number 9. And we come to uh, verse number 3. And so we, we saw what all was in the sanctuary in verse number 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer. And I said when we first started this that there's a difference here in what the old Bible in, in Exodus that censer was on the sanctuary side of the veil. So it was in there with the table of showbread and the candlestick. And when Paul talks about it, he talks about it being after the second veil. And so we, we talked about the veil that was between these that separated it. The priests were always in the sanctuary doing the, the business of the Lord uh, throughout the year and, and every day and, and maybe every hour. I don't know if they did it around the clock. I, I don't know, but uh, they were in there every day doing the things that the Lord wanted them to do and the worship of Him. But beyond this veil, they could, the high priest could only go once per year. And, uh, and so uh, when Jesus came, 
if uh, I want to, I want to read a little bit of uh, of scripture to you. Uh, let me see. I believe it is in Mark, chapter number fifteen, and I want to read to you uh, about Jesus dying. And uh, this ought to be precious scripture to every one of us. The things that he did for us and what he took on with himself, but the things that happened when he died uh, pertains to us and what we're studying here. And uh, and I'll start in Mark chapter number 15, and uh, I'll start in verse... Uh, We'll start in verse 29. And they that passed by railed on him. Remember, he's on the cross now. And said, And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyedest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. They were mocking him because of the things that he said. And said, Likewise, also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, with the scribes He saved others. Himself he cannot save. You know what? I'm pretty glad that day that he didn't choose to save himself. The Bible says that he could have called 12 legions of angels. And they could have come and, buddy, they could have wiped this thing clean. He could have started there. There would not even have been a memory of us left on this world if he had decided to come down from that cross. But he didn't choose to. He didn't choose to save himself. And I, for one, am glad of that. He saved others himself he cannot save. He could have. But he didn't. He said, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were, and they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? And God had to turn his back on Jesus when he died. The only time that he ever did that to him, and I'm sure that that hurt him. And when he saw that happening, imagine the agony that he was under in doing this. He said, And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. One ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave to him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come down, will come to take him down. Buddy, they were mean to him. As mean as they've ever been to any human upon the face of this earth. And he took everything that we should have had to go through for our sins. He took every bit of that for us. Ain't you glad you wasn't up there? If they had done those things and you had the power to come down and to put a stop to all of it, would you have? We probably would have. I probably would have. I wouldn't have been able to take it, but he took it every bit for us, and I'm glad for that. And it said, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And he died. And verse number 38 is what is important to us in our study today. It said, And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And so that veil had stood there, and it was in the temple now, but in that old tabernacle there was a veil too. And when Jesus died, that veil was rent and torn in two. It signified by him dying for us that that way... That bridge was open between where the priests worked and the Holy of Holies. That there was no longer a separation there. That, that uh, those priests had a way that they could worship in there with that. And he tore that veil in two. And there's no more need for it. When that veil was torn in two, what, what happened there? Well... You know, that, that high priest, he had to go every year, once a year, to roll back those sins. And so that veil was torn open because there was a way that Jesus made because he was the perfect sacrifice. Amen. He didn't have to sacrifice for himself. He just made the sacrifice for us. 
And in the days after that, he would make his way to heaven where the true tabernacle is. He's up there right now. And he went once into that place. And we said that these priests were in there every day in the sanctuary, but in that holy of holies, they could only go one day a year. And they had to repeat it every year that this was going on. It had to be a repetition every year, once a year on the Day of Atonement. They went in there. Jesus went once for us, and that once was good enough. And he made the sacrifice that ended all of this. Don't you imagine those priests over the years got so tired of doing the same things over and over and over again just to have the sin rolled over. Didn't even deal with it. There was no perfection in that work. But Jesus went once, perfected that work, and put that blood on that mercy seat in heaven. Amen. Now, the way is open for us to get to God. And we ought to be glad of that. That we don't have to, if this preacher over here was our high priest, that we didn't have to take every little thing that we wanted to talk to God to Him with. Buddy, we've got a way He made open for us. If we've accepted Him as our Savior, buddy, the way is open for us to get to Him. And I'm glad for that. We'll go back and we'll, I'm glad that that veil's been torn in two, buddy, and we've got access to the place where God's at. That sanctuary, and He dwelled on, the, on that ark and that mercy seat. That was His place. and The people couldn't get to Him, but now through Jesus we can get to Him. And I'm glad of that. And it goes on, and it's the golden censer. And so that golden censer would move with the priest when he'd go in there year after year. Now it's just in there. And that incense that's burning is our prayers. It's ever going up there to God. And, and we're praying through Jesus that God would hear our prayers and do something with us. That incense is the prayers of the people going up. And it's ever before the throne of God now, and I'm glad for that. The Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold wherein was the golden pot that had man in him. We know he's our bread of life. And Aaron's rod that budded. He, he died for us and got up again, rose again. His rod budded and he had his life again. And the tables of the covenant. And that signified the law. And he fulfilled the law when we couldn't. He could. He made a way for us by living that law where we couldn't do it. Said, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, which we cannot now speak particularly. He took his blood and he placed it on the real mercy seat in heaven. And that's now that we have forgiveness. It's now that we can be saved because of that blood that is in heaven that he placed there. Said, now these things were thus ordained. The priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing <coughs> the service of God. And so... The priest still had to do this work even after Jesus was, uh, had died. But you say, well, well, then how do we get there? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's 1 Peter chapter number 2. And, uh, and I want to read some, some verses to you. I'll read verses 1 through 10 and uh, show you just who we are and why we have access uh, to the holies of holies and to God himself says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And so uh, he's talking to saved people there. said, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And now he's talking to us, the saved. He said, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus. So what did them priests do when they was inside of that sanctuary? They was just offering up service and, and uh, offering up sacrifices and and gifts unto God. And so what are we to do? We're to do the same thing because we're priests too. It said, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in sign a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made head of the corner. 
and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. And he's talking to us again here. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. All of that, us being the people of God and us getting mercy, is all because of what Jesus did for us. And him placing his blood on that mercy seed and the fact that he stayed up there and he just that other priest he had to come out as soon as he was done when Jesus was done and he just sat down at the right hand of the Father because his work was done and all he does now is offer he's our intercessor he's the one that we go to with our problems and he takes those problems to God and he's lived like we are. He was human just like we are, yet he was God. And so he knows what we're going through, what we face. And we've got a way to him. And so when we pray to Jesus, and when we pray in his name, our prayers do make it there. And I'm glad of that. He said, now these things were thus ordained. The priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Now Jesus went in there, and he did away with that. He didn't have to offer blood for himself. He just offered his blood once for us. And that's all. It, he's not, he'll never go back and offer anything else again because he offered all that he had. And that was perfect. And it was good. Said the Holy Ghost, thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, but when Jesus died, it was made manifest. He fixed it all for us. Which was a, we just go on and read verse number 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Jesus was the Reformation. And he came and he fixed all that. All the things that were just a picture of what he was that they did in the Old Testament. He came in the New Testament and he accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished to be our Savior, to be our intercessor. He's our high priest up there now making intercession for us. And instead of us having to live out this law, we just, God looks on us as perfect just because we have his blood applied to our lives. And he's up there now intercessing for us. We ought to be the happiest people in this world. Knowing what we have in heaven going for us. Buddy, the Bible says if the Lord be for us, who can be against us? And ain't it wonderful that he's up there for us. And one of these days, he is going to get up. He's going to get up one more time. When he gets up that one more time, he's going to take us. And we're going to get to be with him forever. Ain't that wonderful? And I'm thankful for that. That's all the Lord gave me this morning. I hope it's been a help. And and uh, I'm glad that he helps me. Sometimes I read all this stuff and I don't know where to, where to go or where to start. And If you get anything out of this, you get it because it's him, not because it's me. And I appreciate him standing up here with me. Remember the remaining part of the service. Remember Philip as he stands and the singing. I'll... Come back next Sunday and bring somebody with you.